You're, You're listening, listening to Thyroid, Thyroid Talk, Talk with Dr. Angela Mazza, D.O. Welcome. I'm Dr. Angela Mazza, a thyroid, endocrine, and metabolism specialist with an integrative practice in Central Florida. My goal for this podcast is to define and demystify the thyroid gland and thyroid-related medical conditions. By providing information in an easy-to-understand format, I hope to help patients better understand the ways in which their bodies work and to help patients thrive. I'm happy that my friend and co-host Don Sheffield is here with me for episode five, where we're going to talk about labs. Dr. Mazza, hey everybody. I'm really excited about today's show. I even brought a squeaky toy. I just wish it was shaped like a thyroid. <laughs> what? <laughs> Didn't you find the topic of labs well, a little dry? Dry? No way. In fact, quite the opposite. Labs are water lovers. They can be strong swimmers, too, and very muddy at times. I always have to keep a pile of clean towels ready. Not only that, but they can be so loving, so loyal. Okay, lesson learned. We do refer to lab tests as labs, (laughs) Dawn. I see how that might be confusing now. It's so confusing. Obviously, especially when the entire subject of the thyroid can seem super complex. Oh, now you know I'm just kidding, but I do love labs of the canine variety. Me too. But yes, today's subject, lab work and lab results, correlate to a patient's symptoms. How they correlate to a patient's symptoms can be confusing. And yes, the subject can be a bit dry. So we're going to do our very best to make it 100% friendly, like a real lab, but without the slobber. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, a little <laughs> slobber. <laughs> Listeners, please remember that our goal is to make the thyroid understandable for folks with no medical training. Of course, if you have questions or need clarification, please send your thoughts and questions to thyroidtalk.maza at gmail.com. We may disclose your general location on the air, like the city or town, for example, but we won't read your name nor your address on the show. And boy, I'm glad of that because I might have an embarrassing question to submit anonymously. <laughs> about labs? Uh, yeah, about <laughs> labs. Oh, wait a minute. I just gave myself away. Uh, oh, oh, I'm asking for a friend, of course. Um, and we do want to start a segment answering listener questions and comments. So do send them in, folks. There are no stupid questions. And getting started with this episode, my understanding is that all of the numbers on the lab report that are related to thyroid function matter. Plus, they really only matter in the context of how they correlate to or represent how the patient is feeling and what their symptoms are. Exactly. That's because we're not a number, right? Laboratory values are used as a guide. They're helpful for diagnosis and helpful for guiding treatment. Most lab values are a range. They're created off of population studies. Say, for example, a white blood cell count, or WBC. White blood cells can tell tell if someone has an infection if the value is is really high or if they're immunocompromised if the value is really low. So if we check the WBC count of 100 people, the majority, meaning 95 to 98%, will fall within the normal range. That being said, there are going to be some people who are not sick nor immunocompromised who don't fall within that range that are completely normal. What matters is how the lab value in question in the case of our conversation today, thyroid values, correlates to the person in question. And to find a way to more easily understand and to explain the processes behind how lab result numbers are determined, we decided to look at this situation as if the thyroid is a home builder. I'm not sure the thyroid should be in charge at this (laughs) point, but for now, we'll just let the thyroid take the lead. Why not? Yeah, why not? Just as a refresher, the thyroid gland is a tiny but very powerful organ. It's roughly the shape of a butterfly positioned at the base of the neck, at the front. It secretes thyroid hormones that serve many functions in the body, like helping us burn calories, metabolize our food, stay warm, and stay active without feeling sleepy and sluggish. It serves many other purposes, too. So let's say that to be a home builder, our thyroid gland has to work with a general contractor, a sort of building coordinator whose name is Feedback Loop. (laughs) Feedback Loop. Got it. 
Weird name, but he's licensed and insured. I checked. Feedback Loop is a legit general contractor with just a couple of subcontractors working for him. And the homes being built are actually hormones being created and released. Feedback Loop builds these hormones in a neighborhood called Thyroid Hormones Estate. Catchy name for a subdivision. How are the homes, I'm sorry, I mean the hormones built? (laughs) Feedback Loop has a big job. He coordinates all the activities of three builders, whom we'll think of as subcontractors. They have to work together under the direction of Feedback Loop, but they all work on different aspects of the job. Just like how a plumber, electrician, and concrete specialist work separately, but towards the same end goal. In this case, the three subcontractors working for our builder are hypothalamus, pituitary, and the thyroid itself. The thyroid is actually involved in the process, just not not just sitting in the air-conditioned construction trailer, like some of those do. <laughs> just kidding. They all work for feedback loop, but they independently handle different tasks. Well, let's talk about these subcontractors and what we know about them. In this example, when feedback loop is working with the thyroid, he uses a process that depends upon the actions and reactions of the subcontractors. Again, they are the hypothalamus, an area of the brain, the pituitary gland, a gland that sits between the lobes of the brain, and the thyroid itself. According to its resume, the hypothalamus is a tiny area of the brain that controls multiple processes and substances in the body. But for the thyroid, the hypothalamus releases a substance called sensibly a releasing hormone. Oh, I mean, that does make sense, doesn't it? Its technical name is actually thyrotropin releasing hormone, or TRH. Thyrotrophs are specialized cells in the pituitary gland that are stimulated by TRH. Tropin means having an affinity for. Put that together and TRH is a hormone that triggers these specific cells or thyrotrophs in the pituitary. So simply put, any releasing hormone stimulates the release of specific other hormones from a gland. And the hypothalamus does this every time it senses that more thyroid hormone is required to circulate in the bloodstream. Once the hypothalamus produces TRH, the pituitary, specifically those thyrotrophs, release a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. It's great that the hypothalamus can do that, and it's a big deal. But the pituitary gland can also sense when more thyroid hormone is required. Both the hypothalamus and the pituitary can sense when more thyroid hormone is needed. The pituitary is stimulated not only by the hypothalamus, but also by thyroid hormone levels. Well, sticking with our thyroid hormone estate scenario, the pituitary is taking orders from a couple of different bosses, it seems. Remember that TRH stands for thyrotropin releasing hormone, but TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. Two different substances, but they work together, hand in hand. So the pituitary gland is also a major builder in our feedback loop story. And weirdly, I seem to be the pituitary's (laughs) champion today. I I know, and I never (laughs) saw that coming, frankly. Um, When it's working for the thyroid and not for some other purpose, the pituitary gland is responsible for releasing the hormone you just referenced called TSH. It's amazing to me that organs like the pituitary or just an area of the brain, like the hypothalamus, can sense when something is needed by the body, and then not just sense it, but command that that substance be provided. So here's a question. Just as the thyroid feedback loop can command the three players, our subcontractors, to create and release certain hormones, Can it also just as easily tell them to stop producing and stop releasing those same hormones? Yes. And when our bodies are in balance, feedback loop continually senses, releases, and stops, senses, releases, and stops just the right things in the right amounts at the right times. It's when that doesn't happen properly that we get out of balance. So those are the resumes of our three subcontractors, hypothalamus, pituitary, and thyroid. They're all controlled by the general contractor we're calling Feedback Loop. And you know another interesting thing about construction sites. They usually have a lot of transportation vehicles on the lot. Big trucks, mostly. Right, and our subdivision, Thyroid Hormone Estates, is no exception. 
In fact, this construction site has very specialized custom transportation vehicles. And not only that, but it has its own sophisticated transport system, too. What's so cool is that this specialized transportation system has a catchy name. It's TBG. TBG sounds like the name of a super efficient high speed <laughs> rail system. Kind of does. Here, woo woo! Here comes the TBG right on time. <laughs> yes, it's catchy. But, well, until we spell out what TBG stands for, I guess, it's thyroid binding globulin. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> That's a downer. <laughs> <laughs> really unfortunate. <laughs> thyroid binding globulin. Let's stick with TBG. Mm, yeah, let's do. All right. Is a protein. It grabs a hold of the hormones that the thyroid secretes, then... Let me guess. It glomps onto those hormones. Glomps being the technical term, <laughs> as you know. Very technical. It, mm-hmm, it glomps onto those hormones and zips them all around in the bloodstream. Just like how we might do errands for the construction site in one of the trucks. It takes the hormones wherever they are needed in the body. And with TBG behind the wheel acting as a driver, the truck can even have a couple passengers. The passengers are T4... Remember, that's thyroxine. And some T3 is also along for the ride. T3 stands for triode or thyronine. They are actually related to TBG, kind of like cousins, I guess. Oh, so we've got some nepotism on this (laughs) job site. Great. And our little passengers with their long names, shortened to T3 and T4, were both created by the thyroid gland. Our thyroid glands use iodine, like the kind from iodized salt, for example, and combine it with tyrosine. That's how T3 and T4 come to life in time to bind with that protein, our little truck driver, TBG. Once TBG is no longer bound to T4 or T3, or once they're no longer sitting in his truck, they're called free T4 and free T3. Essentially, they are no longer being driven here and there by TBG. They're actually acting on their own. They're free. So free T4 can convert to T3 or reverse T3. We'll touch on that in a bit. And free T3 can bind to thyroid hormone receptors on the cells to do its thing. But how T3 and T4 ever climbed up into that truck scab (laughs) or fastened their seatbelts remains a mystery. (laughs) Yeah, we'll definitely need an animated video on that one. We do. (laughs) I certainly do. (laughs) So now we come to interpreting lab test results and how numbers on a report may or may not correlate identically with what a patient is feeling or exhibiting. Remember... T4 is the hormone that the thyroid produces the most of, but to be active and engaged, to be or to be an alert and active passenger in the truck that TBG driving, T4 must also be converted to T3. When T4 is converted into T3, it comes to life. It is now T3, and he can suddenly do the work it was born to do. Converted T4, now called T3, lets the thyroid gland do its metabolic magic. And I don't want to be a downer here, but this seems, um, I'm sure it's going to be ignorant, but this seems like a system that's not very efficient. It seems really circuitous and a bit tortured. If the thyroid produces so much T4 and so little T3, why not just make exactly the right amount of each one to start with? Good point. But for all intents and purposes, this is another internal control of our thyroid levels. We really don't always want a lot of active T3 or active thyroid hormone around because T4 and T3 have different half-lives. A half-life refers to the time required for the body to eliminate a substance, in this case a hormone, by natural processes to half of its original amount. You might hear half-lives also in reference to how long a medicine takes to get out of our system. T4 has a half-life of about a week and T3 has a half-life of about one day. So here I want to introduce a new term. It's euthyroid. That's spelled E-U-T-H-Y-R-O-I-D. And simply put, it means normal thyroid function. When we are talking lab results, it means within the normal thyroid range. Medical folks just had to have a weird, fancy word for what the rest of us spell (laughs) N-O-R-M-A-L. You know we did. I hope I spelled that right. (laughs) That would be embarrassing. (laughs) That would be so (laughs) awful. So, well, when a patient has blood drawn and the lab report comes back to me, I look really carefully at all the numbers. But I spend a good amount of time analyzing the relationship between three of these numbers on the report. They are the numbers representing TSH, remember that's thyroid stimulating hormone, as well as T4 and T3. 
If the TSH is in the normal range, and if T3 and T4 are also normal, that tells me that technically the patient's thyroid function is also normal, according to the established ranges. But if their TSH is low and their T3 and T4 range from normal to high, then I know the may, patient may have an overactive thyroid. That's called hyperthyroid. Now conversely, if the TSH is high, but both their T3 and T4 range from normal to low, then I can make the diagnosis of underactive thyroid, also called hypothyroid. As we planned this episode, I took a long look at my latest blood test results, and it sure was a lot more interesting to look at my TSH, T3, T4, and reverse T3 levels once I understood what a complex balancing act was involved in getting to those numbers. Our goal is to get them into the in-range column. That's the column we want our numbers to be in, not the out-of-range column, which indicates an imbalance. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned reverse T3. That's one last term in this section that's relevant to the discussion at hand. I briefly mentioned it earlier because reverse T3 is actually an inactive thyroid hormone. It's like the evil alter ego of a thriving T3. It's missing one little bit of iodine that T3 has, so it's not active. Reverse T3 levels go up if a person is stressed or ill. It can also be elevated if a person is receiving too much T4. What purpose does reverse T3 serve? I read in some of your writing that it may reflect mitochondrial function, and I know about mitochondria, but what does that mean as it relates to the thyroid? Well, remember the body is always focused on survival. The mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. So think back to the recesses in your brain in high school biology days. <laughs> That's a really long stretch right there. Oh, come on. Reach way back, all, right. all the way back to the I'm diagram going. of the cell and all the organelles. Remember organelles? I do va very <laughs> vaguely. <laughs> well, the mitochondria make energy to fuel the functions of the cell. If the cell is drained of its energy by stress, illness, or even certain medicines, the goal is to conserve energy. Reverse T3 is a way of doing that. Active T3 is active metabolically, and reverse T3 is inactive. It's actually a protective mechanism, you know? The brain is probably the most tightly regulated system when it comes to thyroid and reverse T3. And recently, I also became aware that thyroid function and liver health are extremely connected. Why is that? Well, the liver is one of the organs that is associated with the main enzyme that converts T4 to T3. It's known, this enzyme is known as diiodinase 1 or DIO1. DIO1 is responsible for most of the circulating T3 in our system. So, if someone has liver damage, they don't convert T4 to T3 very well. This is also seen in persons with chronic kidney disease. Thyroid health and liver health depend upon each other in other ways also, because if there's poor thyroid function, this impairs liver function. Remember our TBG? Our thyroid hormone estate truck driver? The liver is responsible for the production of that protein. So, hypothyroidism is associated with increased TBG, which goes along with having less free T4 and T3, and hyperthyroidism is associated with having less TBG, which equals more free T4 and T3. Make sense? Well, you know, I want to say, <laughs> well, obviously, thyroid lab values aren't nearly as complicated as I thought they were, but you know, I'd be lying. <laughs> I'm lost in a thick, I think you lost me at organelles. <laughs> I, I've been distracted since you asked me that question. <laughs> I hope they existed that long ago. I mean, I hope we knew about them. Um, anyway, I uh, am lost in a thick brain fog at the moment, so I'm just going to squeak this toy for echolocation like a bat so maybe I can find my way back. Oh, you got to lift the fog, Dawn. I, I'm trying. <laughs> well, in an ideal world, lab values would not be complicated. But remember, we're people, not lab values. I see a lot of patients who have already seen other physicians, including other endocrinologists, Yet I hear one similar complaint. Well, they tell me my lab report numbers are good and normal, but why don't I feel that way? Mm -hmm. Well, here we get into the nuances of thyroid hormone physiology. Everybody's optimal range may be a little bit different, meaning just because they're in the normal range does not mean that they are optimal. And there may be a number of reasons for that. We're going to get into the impact of other hormones like cortisol, female and male hormones in future episodes, I promise. 
if a person's TSH may look good and their T4 and T3 may look good, but their T3 can be in the low normal range, is it because they are converting more to the inactive T3 or reverse T3? Do they not have the right micronutrients like iodine and iron to do that? Could there be a genetic factor? Is there actually an underlying autoimmune thyroid disease, mainly Hashimoto thyroiditis, whose diagnosis has been missed? Well, these are some of the questions we're going to try and answer as we move through our journey here on Thyroid Talk. I wanted to do this podcast to provide life-saving education, to clarify the symptoms someone may be experiencing, and encourage them to see a doctor in time to prevent or mitigate damage. That's deeply fulfilling. I know. I'm sure it is. (laughs) It is. I enjoy helping folks understand how their lives, their diets, stress management, sleep patterns, every aspect of their lives are tied to both thyroid and overall health. This also has a lot to do with why I went to endocrinology. It's a medical art that combines science with the study of our lives and all that they encompass. Well, I sure hope you'll continue listening to Thyroid Talk with Dr. Angela Mazza. We have many more interesting episodes and guests planned. We're going to build on today's foundation and cover some topics I think you'll find meaningful. In fact, in our next episode, we'll discuss what are the different thyroid hormone replacement therapies and which one might be right for you. As always, my goal is to help us live more fulfilling lives by taking control of our health and thus feel our best. We hope you found this episode on thyroid lab test values to be interesting, and we hope you'll continue to follow this podcast. To recap just some of what we covered here, and not necessarily in this order, lab report numbers specifically related to the thyroid, how they are understood, how numbers on a lab report may or may not correlate with what a patient is feeling or exhibiting, why some patients seem to have good thyroid lab results, but they don't feel as good as their numbers look, the nuances of thyroid hormone physiology, the feedback loop, how it controls thyroid hormone levels, the difference between bound and unbound or free thyroid hormone levels. We also covered basic thyroid physiology and the role of thyrotrophs, the hypothalamus, pituitary, reverse T3, and TRH. We discussed TSH, releasing hormones, the thyroid gland, and TBG. Why the thyroid doesn't just make the right amounts of both T3 and T4 to start with. T4 and T3 have different half-lives. Half-lives defined and what the half-lives are for T3 and T4. Youth thyroid defined and pronounced and spelled. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How to approach basic thyroid lab values like TSH, T4, and T3. And finally, the difference between T4 and T3. Best of all, it's great to know that we can impact our thyroid health. As Dr. Mazza mentioned, In our next episode, episode six, I know, I'm just really excited, (laughs) we'll discuss thyroid hormone replacement uh, replacement options and what might be right for you. We welcome your comments, show ideas, and questions for future episodes. Please send them to thyroidtalk.maza at gmail.com. We may disclose your general location on air the city or town, for example, but we will not read your name nor your address on the show. Don't forget to ask your healthcare provider about any specific questions regarding your wellness. This podcast is meant for educational purposes only.